All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another live deep sky tour. Uh, my name is Stephen Hummel. I'm our dark sky specialist here at McDonald Observatory. And McDonald Observatory is a, a division of the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, tonight I'm going to be showing you uh, some more interesting galaxies up in the sky right now uh, through this 16-inch telescope behind me. If you're curious about the uh, tech details of this telescope and all the equipment I'm using, uh, you can find uh, a, a description of all that stuff in the, uh, in the description part of this video. Um, but all right, tonight we're going to be looking at some galaxies as well as talking about the mysterious force known as dark energy. And if you have any questions for uh, me or, or uh, to staff in general at McDonald during the program, if you're watching this live, uh, you can send your questions uh, in the live chat. And we have a team of moderators in the chat to answer some of those questions for you. And they'll also save some of those questions for me uh, at the end of the program, uh, if perhaps a question can't be answered in, in the short confines of text in the chat, or we think it's a particularly good question. All right, but again, you don't have to wait to the end to send in your questions. You can do that at any time. Okay, so tonight uh, we're going to be looking at some galaxies, but first a word about uh, where I am. Uh, I am located out in the mountains uh, in the middle of nowhere of far west Texas. Uh, here are some of our re research telescopes on top of the mountain. I'm located down at our visitor center. Now, our, our, the observatory is still closed to the public, so unfortunately you can't uh, come and visit us right now. Uh, we don't know when we're going to be opening. We don't have a date yet, but uh, we will post that date uh, on social media. We'll let you know when, when we are again open to the public. Um, so I'm located in the dome with the arrow on it, and uh, the reason I am uh, out here at uh, McDonald Observatory, why McDonald Observatory is located out in far west Texas, uh, is because of our dark skies. Uh, we have some of the darkest skies uh, in the continental US, uh, and we're, we're very proud of that, and I work very hard to uh, try to keep it that way, um, because uh, darkness, natural darkness of night is really important to seeing the faint fuzzy things we're going to try to see tonight. And if you're curious about what you can do uh, to help keep the skies dark, uh, you can go to our website, mcdonaldobservatory.org, under the Learn tab and read about our Dark Skies Initiative and uh, the efforts we take uh, to try to preserve naturally dark skies, like you see here in this picture of the Milky Way from a few nights ago. But tonight's topic is going to be uh, about the dark side of the universe. Uh, if you joined us last session, last week, uh, you're familiar with this pie chart then. Uh, so last week, uh, I talked about how uh, there's a mysterious substance known as dark matter. Uh, and dark matter is something which we can't see, touch, or feel, or interact with in any way, uh, but it has mass, and we know it's there because of the influence of that mass, because of, of the gravity, essentially, it creates. Uh, and, the, well, that's about a little over a quarter of everything in the universe, this dark matter stuff, which we don't understand. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the bulk of the universe, uh, dark energy. And uh, dark energy is something that, again, we, we don't really know exactly what it is. We can't see it directly. We can't touch it or feel it. But it's everywhere. And dark energy is accelerating the expansion of the universe. And that's kind of a big topic uh, I'm going to get into. And we're going to explore that tonight, how we know dark energy is a real thing, even though we can't directly see or touch it uh, or mess with it, or haven't been able to, at least yet so far. That's definitely a goal of physicists to try to detect it directly. Uh, but uh, how do we know uh, that these invisible forces are real? Well, like most things in uh, astronomy, it's originates from spectroscopy, the science of breaking starlight apart and analyzing the spectrum that you get. Uh, it's like a rainbow is a natural spectrograph, taking light and breaking it into its component colors. When we do this to stars and galaxies and things, you get a pattern with lines missing in the resulting spectrum. And those lines are the fingerprints of certain elements within that star or other light emitting object. And so, uh, if you recall from last time, uh, we can detect the motion of uh, a star or other object uh, by its red or blue shift. So if something is coming at you, then the light becomes more blue. But more often in astronomy, we find that 
stuff becomes more red because it's moving away from us and the lines get shifted over to the red end of the spectrum and that's called the red shift and if we can measure the red shift of an object then we can measure how fast it's moving away from us and what we find is that with the exception of only a few galaxies very close by all the galaxies we see in the sky are moving away from us and the further away you look the more distant that galaxy is the more red shifted it is and this is because of the expansion of the universe and the reason for the expansion of the universe at an accelerating rate it was something called dark energy it's kind of just a placeholder name until we figure out what's really underlyingly responsible so uh, right now uh, there is a big project going on here at McDonald Observatory uh, to understand dark energy uh, and it's taking place uh, on our our largest telescope here uh, and this would be our Hobby Eberly uh, telescope and I'll show you here a picture of the Hobby Eberly telescope here in just a quick moment and I'll get that up for you here um, so the Hobby Eberle Telescope is an enormous telescope, which we just completed a massive upgrade on. Uh, it's uh, one of the largest telescopes in the world, and we just installed a lot of spectrographs. And these spectrographs are going to take spectra of things in the sky. So uh, there it is outside. It's the dome in the foreground that houses our Hobby Eberle Telescope. And what it's going to do, this enormous telescope, is it's going to survey a huge area of the sky most of what you're familiar with most of that uh is in the area of the big dipper or maybe if, uh, if you're from the uk you may know it as the plow but americans call it the big dipper so the hobby eberly telescope is making a huge map of the universe in that region of the sky right now as we speak it's working on this and it's trying to map out how millions of galaxies are moving and trying to essentially measure how fast they're moving away from us. It's trying to measure their redshift. And the reason for this is basically that uh, in the history of the universe, let me fix that here for you. Um, shortly after the Big Bang, the first stars formed, stars and galaxies develop, uh, but the universe was dominated by dark matter. Dark matter, as we saw last week, uh, is something that essentially clumps and keeps things together. It's got a lot of mass, so it tends to keep things together. But about five billion years ago in the universe, dark energy started to take over. And essentially what dark energy did is it, ex it accelerates the expansion of the universe, moving galaxies and things further apart. Now, when people think the universe is expanding a lot of times the first question they they ask is what is it expanding into right but that's not how this works uh the universe isn't expanding into anything the universe is creating more space essentially so the the distance between galaxies is ever growing and there's this kind of cosmic tug of war at at play here uh early in the universe dark matter dominated and it kept things together but over time, as things got further apart, dark energy became more and more apparent, push, bringing things further apart. All right, so that's what we're going to discuss in a little more detail tonight. We're, I'm going to show you some galaxies. I'm going to talk about how we know they're moving up, how, uh, away from us and how fast, as well as some other ways we know that the universe is expanding. Uh, as well as just look at some pretty galaxies, right? Because that's, that's all, always fun, too. All right, so the first galaxy we're going to look at tonight uh, is known as uh, M, uh, M63, and it is also known as the Sunflower Galaxy, um, because it kind of looks like a sunflower in a way. So uh, here is where it is located in the sky, um, and you can see that there is a, um, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a, a, a my laser pointer here and it's pointed at that particular spot um, in the sky that's where we're located it's, it's kind of near the Big Dipper but not quite and here I can play around with this and show you a little more 
Um, so we're facing kind of generally north at the moment. Alrighty, so I'm going to try to... Mm, I have a, a slight problem here with the telescope. I had it in the field of view earlier, so why is it not doing it right now? Hmm. Give me a quick moment. I ha I know it's uh, the galaxy's there, uh, but something may have happened to it. Uh, or to the tel to my field here. So let me go slew back to it and see if that helps. Oh, okay. All right, there we go. Yes, I have figured it out. Sorry for that little pause there. Uh, just be a, a moment here, and uh, we're going to have a look. All right, so uh, the telescope is taking the exposure of the Sunflower uh, Galaxy, and there we go. It's a nice big big spiral galaxy, uh, and uh, it is a special kind of spiral galaxy. As a matter of fact, it's known as a flocculent galaxy. And a flocculent is a, is a great word. It literally, literally just means fluffy. It is a fluffy galaxy galaxy and you can kind of see why uh, we call it that let me add some more contrast to the image uh, you can see that there are lots of spiral arms uh, kind of a, a very tightly wound uh, and a, a brighter core of the galaxy at the center um, but if you try to like count those spirals try to figure out exactly where they begin and where they end you you kind of have a hard time, right? So, so the spirals are very, very, very wound over and over again, so much so that you, we can't really even distinguish an exact spiral shape. Uh, and that's essentially uh, what a flocculent galaxy is. So if we go back to our, our classifications of different galaxies here, uh, we have uh, there's a lot of different kinds of galaxies. And if you joined us with the previous sessions, you're, you're familiar with this chart. Uh, but it, this is a spiral galaxy, so it's on the top. Um, but uh, this, this uh, actually, this graph, this chart, uh, doesn't have a category for flocculent. Uh, and so we're kind of branching away from this. Uh, this this uh, chart is not comprehensive, is, is essentially my point. It's a rough breakdown, uh, but there's still some variety within the galaxies, uh, which we're also going to see tonight. Okay, so back to our live view. Um, so yeah, you can definitely see that that uh, very tightly wound spiral shape. Let me see if I can get a little more uh, contrast to the image. That's not what I want. Yeah, there we go. It's, so in a telescope, it roughly looks like, uh, well, it roughly looks like that. It's a relatively dim galaxy, um, but let me bring the, the brightness back. Okay, so you can kind of see why we call it the sunflower. Well, the Sunflower Galaxy, our M63, is located uh, about 29 million light years away. Uh, 29 million light years. So that means it took 29 million years uh, for the light to reach us at the speed of light. So one light year is 5.88 trillion miles. Right? So that's the distance light travels in a single year, 5.88 trillion miles. And it, that times uh, 23 million is the distance to this galaxy. Okay, so 29 million light years away, and it's moving away from us. It has a redshift of 484 kilometers per second. So this galaxy is receding away from us because of the expansion of the universe at 484 kilometers per second. In other terms, that's about one million miles per hour. It, this galaxy is moving away from us at a million miles per hour. But in the vast distances uh, that we're working at, that's actually not that fast, a million miles per hour. It's still, uh, so th in other words, if you were to try to launch a rocket in the direction of this galaxy at you know a million miles per hour, you would never reach it because it's moving away from you because new space, because of dark energy, is, is basically expanding the universe in between us and that galaxy. And what we're going to see tonight is that the further away the galaxy, the faster it's moving away from us. It's called the Hub Hubble Law. And basically, that's because uh, the further away you look, the more space you're looking through, the more empty space there, the more dark energy there is, in, or the fabric of the universe there is being created in between us and them. So that's what we're gonna we're gonna uh, see that more directly tonight. 
Um, all right, so M63, Sunflower Galaxy. Uh, it's about 29 million light years away. It's moving away from us at a million miles per hour. So next up, uh, we're going to look at another uh, very different, uh, differently structured spiral galaxy that's not located um, too far off. And uh, this next one here uh, is known as M94. And you can see that uh, we were looking at M63. M94 is not very far away. So that's where we're going to go. Don't even have to move the dome. It's really not that far uh, of a movement for the telescope. All right, so now we're going to wait for the, the picture to um, roll in here. Uh, it's taken that exposure 15 seconds long to collect as many photons as we can. All right, there we go. And it's a little little high up in the frame, so I'm going to start. I'm going to try to center that a little better for you, uh, so that uh, we can get a little little better image here. All right. All right, so I just made a small uh, nudge of the telescope, and uh, let's see uh, if that centered it a little better this time. All right, I, I kind of overdid it there. You can see what happens when I keep moving the telescope. So let's move it back up. And clear that out. All right, so M94, the galaxy we're going to look at here, uh, is 16 million light years away. So it's a lot closer uh, than the one we just looked at. Uh, well, relatively speaking. Uh, and um, it is uh, uh, a, another spiral galaxy, although a little different than the one uh, that we just saw uh, before. Uh, this, this one uh, is not a flocculent one. It's not as tightly wound. Um, at the center. Uh, instead, uh, this one uh, has a, a kind of actually a, a almost ring structure to it, which you will see in a moment. All right, so we're going to start stacking exposures here. All right, so uh, this is also known as the Cat's Eye Galaxy. There's also a, a Cat's Eye Nebula, so don't confuse the term. This is just a nickname the cat's eye galaxy uh, and you can see it's very bright at the center uh, and it's also got a kind of a very faint halo around it which we'll begin to bring out uh, in more detail here if I uh, reset the exposure try to bring out more detail sorry it's taking a little long too long uh, to get this one set up um, but uh, so it's called the cat's eye galaxy essentially because it's got that bright center and an outer outer ring and then another fainter fainter area around it too. Uh, that's kind of the, the origin of that nickname. All right, that's, that's giving me some trouble tonight. It's saying, I don't really want to work with you. Okay, that's fine. I will, I will make it work. It will just take me a, a little bit longer than I would like. There we go. Okay, so now you can really see it. Um, so, uh, you can see that there's a very bright area in the center, and so bright in the center because uh, there's a lot of star formation going on right in the middle where it's very bright. It's a starburst galaxy. Uh, and you can also see that there is a spiral shape to it, uh, and there's kind of a, almost a brighter ring around this edge of the spiral, and then there's an outer area as well. So what we think happened to cause the shape is that uh, the galaxy probably had a strong bar in the center. So if we look back at our, our chart, uh, you can see that there are barred spirals on the bottom. And the bar is essentially an instability within the central part of the galaxy, where uh, stars are, um, are, uh, are bulging up, essentially clumping together, uh, and it kind of is almost a feedback effect. Uh, and the action of the bar essentially is, can bring the galaxies out towards the outer parts of, of the galaxy. Uh, and essentially, uh, over time, the bar falls apart and it le can leave behind a sort of a, a ring-shaped structure. Um, so that's how we believe uh, this, uh, this um, formation within the galaxy formed. And I have a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope um, of this galaxy uh, that kind of illuminates a little more about uh, what I'm talking about. All right, so you can see here in this Hubble Space Telescope view uh, that there is a, a ring of bright stars, uh, and that's essentially a, 
uh, left over from a, a bar structure that has since kind of disintegrated and kind of strewn them out and it's kind of returning back towards a, a more traditional spiral structure, although the bar uh, may come back later on. All right, so uh, again, this, this galaxy, M94, uh, is uh, 16 million light years away. And it's moving away from us at 360 kilometers per second. Whereas the one before is about twice as far and was receding away at uh, closer to 500 or 490 or so kilometers per second. So again, the further away you look, the faster they're, they're moving away from us. This one isn't moving away from us all that fast. We would consider this galaxy to be uh, somewhat close to us um, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, again, only only 16 million years for the light to reach us. Alrighty, so uh, I apologize for the long wait there on uh, getting getting the target centered up for you. Uh, you know, it's, it's a complicated process, and sometimes it doesn't all go, go according to plan. But uh, next up, we have got um, some more interesting galaxies. All right, so we saw we saw a flocculent galaxy with very tightly wound spirals. Uh, we saw uh, a galaxy with a ring structure to it. And uh, next up, we're going to see a grand design spiral galaxy. I'm going to slew over to NGC 5364. This one uh, does not have a fun nickname. So if you think of a fun nickname for this one, uh, why, don't you, why don't you let us know in the chat and we'll come up with one, right? They're all just kind of made up anyway. So, yeah. Alrighty, so I'm going to move the dome now to line up with the telescope. It's going to take a, take a minute here. Alright, so the dome and the telescope are now lined up with each other uh, and uh, let's see uh, what our our view is like here and just a quick second Alrighty. all right so here we go we're gonna have the exposure taken here in just a second All right, that's because I was still moving the telescope when I clicked it. That's why I'll get rid of that. Okay, so the uh, this galaxy is, uh, uh, again, NGC 5364. And it's located 54 and a half uh, million uh, light years away. And you can see um, that unlike the other two galaxies we just looked at, this one has a very obvious, very loosely wound spiral structure um, to it. And so what's going on is, is that this is a uh, what we call a grand design spiral galaxy. And a grand design spiral, it basically just means that the spiral structure is very well formed, uh, it's very neatly arranged, and it's nearly symmetrical. It's not perfectly symmetrical in this case. Uh, it does have a little companion galaxy over here uh, that has perhaps influenced it. Um, but uh, it is pretty, pretty close to being a, a perfect spiral shape to it. So again, a very loosely wound. And it does have a sort of bar structure, right? It's kind of got this uh, elongated uh, side to the center part. Um, so I think this is a good one. This is uh, a rather challenging uh, galaxy to see in a telescope, but it, I can do it with a, with a large telescope visually. Uh, it is possible to see, but it is on the fainter side. Um, it is also a lot further than the two galaxies we just saw. So again, the two galaxies we just, we just saw were uh, about 29 million and then 16 million light years away. This one is 54 and a half million light years away. Uh, and it's part of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies, uh, uh, so a large concentration. It's kind of near the outskirts. Um, but the uh, uh, this galaxy is moving away from us um, at 1,240 kilometers per second or that's 2.7 million miles per hour. Okay, 2.7 million miles per hour. That's how fast this galaxy is moving away. And again, we know that because of the red shift. Uh, if we take a spectrum of a part of the galaxy, we see that as a whole, the galaxy is receding away. 
Uh, and also for this galaxy, because we're seeing it more face on, uh, it, we would not see much of the motion of how it's spinning, right? So we, we would have a harder time determining exactly how fast it's spinning uh, because it's not spinning towards or away from us, but it is receding away. So we can see that that, that movement with regards to the expansion of the universe. So, uh, all right. Uh, and our chart, uh, this would this would be kind of in the, um, uh, it's a barred spiral with very loose arms. It's kind of in the SBB category uh, down uh, on the lower part. Again, a, a grand design in particular. Uh, so um, it's a very nice one. I like this one a lot. I think it's kind of an underappreciated uh, little galaxy. And uh, I do have a color image of this one as well. Uh, which is also the thumbnail for this presentation. Uh, and so you can see it's got a lot of color uh, to it. And uh, there's some little pink regions within there, kind of bluish pink arms. And that's a sign that there is star formation happening inside this galaxy, still forming stars. All right, so uh, we saw some face-on spiral galaxies. Uh, and now we're going to look at one uh, that is uh, more edge-on. More edge on, um, and this, this is one. This one's a, uh, a pretty, pretty good galaxy. Uh, this next one, uh, it's nicknamed the Hamburger Galaxy. Actually, there's another galaxy that also has that nickname. So if you want to be particular, uh, its true name is NGC uh, 3628, or the Hamburger Galaxy, uh, and it is located. Uh, let's get back here. Um, so that's where we are pointed right now. Uh, the next galaxy we're looking at is over here on the other side and this is the middle part of the sky so i have to flip the telescope over essentially to point it over here so that's where we're going next the hamburger galaxy all right so you see the telescope moving behind me i'm going to start moving the dome too Uh, this next galaxy is also a member of what's uh, nicknamed the Leo Trio. We've looked at another member of the Leo Trio before at a previous uh, previous program. M66 uh, was another member. Um, but uh, this is, so we got two out of three of uh, this little group of galaxies uh, very close to each other, at least in the, in the, um, in the sky. And uh, you can kind of see this on my map here. Um, if you ooh, a little too too far zoomed in, um, that uh, there are uh, a few other, quite a few other galaxies here, um, but this one here and this one here and this one form the Leo Trio, um, and so it's a very very common uh, target to look at in an amateur telescope. It looks pretty nice in an amateur scope. All right, so let me get this all set up here. Alrighty, almost there. I got it in the field of view, centering it up a bit. All right, so uh, taking the exposure, you'll see it here in a minute. Um, but this galaxy is an edge-on galaxy, and you'll kind of see why we call it the hamburger. Um, yeah, that's a nice one. So um, the center part is kind of imagine that the this is sort of the bun, right? Top of the bun, the bottom bun. This is a, a patty. Right, and you got the kind of lettuce and uh, other things kind of sticking out the side. So uh, it's a very, very um, overstuffed, I guess, hamburger in a way, uh, as I would describe it. Um, but this this galaxy is 35 million light years away, uh, and it's receding away from us at 840 kilometers per second. So it's a decent rate. Not as fast as the one we just saw, which is further away. This one isn't moving away from us quite as fast, um, but uh, it is it is still moving away at a, from a human perspective, uh, a very, very fast rate. And uh, you can see that this galaxy um, has a, a lot of dust and gas bisecting it. It's a dust lane. Uh, so uh, like our own Milky Way, our Milky Way has lots of dust and gas, uh, and which uh, where you see pictures of the Milky Way um, and I'll show, show it again. Uh, like our, our own Milky Way has 
has a lot of dust and gas in it. Uh, and we're seeing essentially that, that same dusty material uh, within uh, this other galaxy. And it's all kind of concentrated within the disk, so it's blocking starlight as we view it, um, view it edge on. Okay, so uh, this galaxy, again, it's a member of a, a small group of galaxies, uh, and its neighbors are generally going to stay close to each other because uh, and if galaxies are close enough, gravity is enough to keep them together. Um, but between us and this distant galaxy, uh, dark energy is stronger, essentially, over, than gravity, and so we are moving away from it. Um, but it may be moving towards or away from other galaxies as well. So there's a lot of motions going on. And so when you think about a redshift, you also have to think about the fact that the galaxy has its own motion. And so uh, the redshift gives you a rough idea of how of how far away it is, uh, right? Because as we've noticed, the further away it is, the faster it's moving away. So there is a relationship between the redshift, the rate at which it's moving away, uh, and the distance, but it's not perfect because galaxies move around as well on their own. And that means that uh, you can only get an estimate of the distance from the red shift of a galaxy. Uh, so if you want to be really particular, you want to really know that the universe is expanding, you can't rely on red shifts alone. You need a little bit more accurate measurement. You need some help. And the most accurate way to, know, to gauge a distance to a very distant galaxy is uh, for a supernova to occur there. But not just any supernova, but a type 1a supernova. And uh, this next object isn't on the list, because I didn't think that it was even a possibility until right before I started this program, when I realized that there is such a supernova happening, and it's in a galaxy that's not too far away uh, from from the galaxy we're looking at right now, uh, the Hamburger Galaxy. Uh, and this little galaxy that we're going to look at next, very, very small, piddly one, is known as NGC uh, uh, 3643. Four, 3643. Uh, and it's where my laser is. Uh, and we're going to go right there right now. Don't even have to move the dome, probably. Yep, don't even have to do that. This galaxy uh, also doesn't have a nickname, so if you think for a nickname of this one as well, uh, you know, hey, let us know in the in the comments section. Uh, but I'll, I caution you that this next galaxy is not very photogenic. Uh, I'm, we're going to look at it because of a supernova happening within it. Now we've been very lucky that in the past three live streams, or th this one included, uh, that there have been supernovae going on uh, in, <laughs> in a different galaxy every time. All right, you see this little smudge? That's the galaxy. That's our little friend, NGC 36, 20, uh, 36, um, what was it? What was it? I already forgot. Uh, 36, 43. Yeah. That little thing is a galaxy, and I d could not actually find an accurate distance estimate to this little galaxy. But look at that. That That is not a star. All of these are stars within our own Milky Way. That is a supernova within this tiny galaxy. So that's a star that's blown up. And look how bright it is. It's outshining the entire galaxy. Again, it's a system of many millions or billions of stars, and this one exploding star is brighter than basically the entire galaxy. Uh, and in fact, this, this uh, is the brightest supernova in the sky right now. Uh, and it's a particular kind called the Type 1a. And a type 1a supernova occurs when a small remnant core of a star called a white dwarf, uh, it, which is in orbit around a much larger star, steals material from that larger star. And as that little star gets bigger because it's stealing material, uh, it suddenly uh, it reaches a threshold when it reaches 1.4 times the mass of the sun uh, that uh, basically, it makes it undergo a cataclysmic uh, chain reaction, the fusion reaction, which makes it explode in one tremendous moment. That is, that is what is a, that's what a, a type 1a supernova is. And I have an animation of this. We have a small star orbiting around a much larger one. It's stealing mass, stealing gas from it, reaches the threshold, and then it explodes in one tremendous moment. That's what we're witnessing in this distant little galaxy. And the reason type 1a supernovae are so great, we've got a satellite in the field of view there, 
Uh, but the reason why type 1A supernovae are so great is because uh, they uh, are uh, always essentially the same brightness. So if you see a type 1A supernova and you can identify it as such, and you can measure how bright it is, then you know how far away it is. Because if they're always the same brightness, then it's just a matter of how far away it is making it dimmer, essentially. That's the, that, that's, there may be other slightly complicated factors, um, but they're what we call a standard candle in astronomy. And this measurements, measurements of galaxies with type 1a supernovae back in the 90s is how we discovered dark energy to begin with. Because we knew galaxies were moving around, but before we looked at type 1a supernovae and measured the distances very accurately, and looked at their redshifts as well, uh, we weren't actually sure if the universe is expanding or contracting. They thought actually uh, in the early 90s that the universe uh, would be contracting. But instead, thanks to type 1a supernovae such as this one, we know it's the opposite. The galaxies are getting further away, and we can know this because of accurate distance measurements thanks to these type 1As. So uh, that is a, uh, that's a uh, pretty bright one. Again, it's the brightest supernova in the sky right now. Uh, if you can find this little obscure galaxy, um, that would show up in a small amateur telescope. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, figuring out which one, which little dot it actually is. Um, but again, that wasn't there a few weeks ago. It was discovered in late April, and it'll fade away probably in a few more weeks, slowly taper off as the explosion kind of uh, goes through its course and the light goes on. Alrighty, so uh, we've seen uh, already quite a lot tonight, uh, but we're going to wrap up with, um, with a galaxy uh, cluster. And uh, this next object... Uh, is known as um, the Leo Galaxy Cluster, or sometimes just the Leo Cluster. Uh, it's located right up there. Just going to move the telescope up. Don't even have to move the dome. Also within the constellation of Leo. Uh, and within here are going to be about 70 different um, galaxies. So I'm hoping to show you all at once uh, within the same telescope field of view. Oh, all right, so uh, it's taken the exposure, and uh, th this next one, uh, this this galaxy cluster is much much more distant than anything else we've looked at tonight so far. Uh, it is 330 million light years away. 330 million light years, the Leo cluster. So I've, we've talked before about how galaxies tend to be within clusters. This is kind of a subcluster of the larger coma supercluster of galaxies, kind of a you know adjacent neighborhood, you could say, to a, a much larger cluster. But again, there's, there's easily a few dozen different galaxies visible within this field of view just right here. Um, and in particular, uh, there, there are some, there's this one in the middle, which are, it's an edge on spiral, uh, as well as this big one here, this big um, uh, elliptical galaxy. So if you look back at our, our chart, uh, we actually have represented in this cluster uh, quite a few different kinds of, of galaxies. Uh, we have ellipticals, which you often find in centers of galaxy clusters. And again, ellipticals are formed from lots of uh, galaxies merging together again and again and again, uh, essentially to form one great big blob. Uh, all, because all the spiral structure is destroyed as the galaxies merge. So we have some ellipticals. We also have some spirals. Uh, if we look back in here, um, you can see that uh, there is a spiral uh, galaxy. Uh, this Well, this one's an edge on, right, because it's not round. Um, but there are some kind of gently spirally ones down here as well. Um, but this galaxy right here uh, uh, is an amazing galaxy in itself. This galaxy is home to one of the largest black holes we know of. Uh, the black hole in the center of this elliptical galaxy is 9.7 billion times uh, the mass of the sun. Uh, and so that is, um, that is near the top of the charts. I believe that's about third place within uh, confirmed masses of black holes we know of. Uh, that's one of the most massive black holes, almost almost 10 billion times the mass of the sun uh, lurking within, deep within this little galaxy. Can't see it directly, um, but we know it's there because of its uh, mass and how it's influencing the galaxy as a whole. Uh, so 
again, we see galaxies generally clustered together because mass and especially dark matter is holding things together locally. But this cluster of galaxies is receding away from us at a whopping uh, 10.4 million miles per hour, or 6,600 kilometers per second. That's incredibly, over 10 million miles per hour. Uh, for reference, the speed of light uh, is about 670 million miles per hour. And this is 10 million miles per hour away from us. So, I mean, that's still a small fraction of the speed of light, but frankly, even getting up to a fraction of the speed of light is impressive. Uh, but here's the tricky thing. Again, the further away you look, the further away you look, the faster the galaxies are moving away from you. And we see that because of their redshift. That means eventually, the, if you look far enough away, the galaxies appear to be moving away from us faster than the speed of light. And that may seem impossible, that nothing can travel faster than light, right? But it's not actually moving away from us faster than light. New space, the universe itself, the fabric of space and time is essentially is uh, increasing in scale to put more space between us and them. So it's not being pushed away. Literally new empty space is being created in between us and distant objects. And it's happening all the time, all over the place, but we only really notice it in vast voids within the universe. So uh, if we look at, again, our, our big large scale map of the universe, uh, looking at uh, how galaxies are, are situated, we see that they are located within groups, within clumps, right? So right now we're looking at part of the Coma supercluster, um, and it's kind of in Leo, so uh, kind of, um, if you look in the center, that's where we are. We're not the center of the universe, right? There is no center of the universe, but we're making the map here drawn from the, from where we are and calling that the center arbitrarily. But on the right, you can see the Como supercluster and kind of that clump just below the text that sees the says Como supercluster as what we're looking at right now. Uh, and the Leo supercluster is a dis different one, separate from what we're looking at, that's even further out. So uh, we're looking at across a vast expanse of the universe and you can see that generally speaking that galaxies are clumped together in these strands but it's in those giant voids where we really notice dark energy's effect so uh, dark energy again we don't know what it is we don't know exactly how it works we're trying to figure it out it's basically just a placeholder uh for what eventually will will be some explanation for why this is happening why what is causing space and time to accelerate in its expansion and what this means is that, you know, if you're looking at something, say, 100 million light years away, uh, but the universe is expanding, and it took 100 million years for the light to get from there to, to where you see it, well, since the light traveled to you, because the universe is still expanding, that those galaxies, therefore, must be even further away now. Does that make sense? So they're moving away from us. Let's say it took 10, 100 million years to reach us, but now in reality, they're 105 or 110 million light years away. We call that that true distance accounting for the expansion of the universe, the co-moving distance. And because of that, because the universe is expanding, we can see objects that are more than 13 billion light years away uh, because uh, although the, th the the universe is uh, more than is about 13 billion years old, the further away you look, the further back in time you look. Uh, but because the ga the universe is expanding, we can see things up to about uh, up to about uh, 40 or so 43 uh, billion light years away, accounting for the fact that they've moved since they emitted the light that we see. So the light we see may be so many years old. But the galaxy is now even further away. We just can't see it yet because the light hasn't reached us to relay that fact. Uh, so very mind-bending concepts. Um, but that's that's essentially what we observe, right? That's that's what we observe on a regular basis. Uh, and in fact, the Hobby Eberly Telescope, as as we speak, is looking at galaxies nine to eleven billion light years away, 
uh, probably that are even more distant than that now, uh, to try to figure out what the expansion rate of the universe was back then in the early universe and see if dark energy behaved in a different way than it does now, then hopefully that will help us figure out what dark energy really is uh, once and for all, or at least give us some clues to figure it out more definitely. You know, so astronomers definitely don't know everything, right? I mean, there's a lot we don't understand. Frankly, most of the universe uh, we don't understand, um, but but we do have some tools to work with, and we're we're doing our best uh, to solve these big mysteries here at McDonald Observatory. Uh, that's one of our biggest project here is measuring the expansion rate of the universe because of dark energy as it was nine to eleven billion years ago. All right, so. Big concepts tonight, mind-bending concepts. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. I hope you followed along at least at least halfway through and uh, enjoyed that. Um, so uh, this is where I'm going to wrap up the, the, the uh, Deep Sky Tour. I do want to say that this is going to be the last Deep Sky Tour for a little bit because the moon is going to come up uh, pretty soon uh, in the next few days. We're going to have the moon back in the sky, and the moon will wash out the sky. Uh, and so uh, my colleague Kevin, hopefully, uh, will uh, next week be doing another live moon tour. Uh, so stay tuned for the dates on that. We'll have more information on social media, where you could subscribe to this channel to be notified uh, when the next live program will be. Um, but it's going to be a little, a little while before I do another uh, deep sky tour. Uh, we'll have a whole different targets. We'll move beyond galaxies and start looking at some other stuff, too, within our own Milky Way. All right, but that's going to wrap up the program, but I'm going to be happy to take some questions. Uh, and so if our moderators uh, uh, send me some of your questions, I, I have some of them here pulled up already. Uh, Clayton uh, Yendre asks, uh, what is your preferred personal telescope? That's a good question. Uh, my uh, preferred personal telescope would be a Dobsonian telescope or Dob. D-O-B, as it's often called. Uh, and um, I uh, have had an 8-inch and a 10-inch daub. Um, ideally, I would want the biggest telescope I can get. You know, the bigger it is, uh, the more light it's going to gather. Uh, and so the better the image is going to be. Um, but yeah, for visual use, that's what I would want, a Dobsonian telescope. Um, all right. Uh, John uh, Prismeyer asks, how, could, how do we reconcile the speed through empty space with little or no gravity at relativistic speeds? Um, okay, so, okay, so like, uh, trying to get a, trying to understand the question. So like, yes, yeah, so if um, if you have truly empty space, which really is no such thing, but if you have truly empty space, um, you know, the speed of light is a certain speed, um, oh, with little no gravity. Uh, so. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out what. Uh, let me reread this question. How do you reconcile the speed through empty space with little or no gravity at relatively at relativistic speeds? Um, so this is going to get into some some uh, weird special relativity things. But basically, you know, the um, the speed of light is 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 a constant in the universe. Uh, the faster you go, you know, the more energy it's going to take to get up to that speed. Uh, but from your perspective, uh, you, you know, you're you things would would appear normal uh, up until, you know, you can start to get to really, really crazy fast percentages of the, of the speed of light. Um, and uh, gravity essentially is a, a, a distortion of space and time, right? So the more mass there is, the more space and time has been bent around it. Uh, and so the path you take will be bent. So you can, in other words, um, uh, if, you're, if your light is bent around through space and time, uh, but it's always going to be the same uh, essential speed uh, where they can't exceed a certain speed in a vacuum. Um, not really sure uh, what to, uh, maybe you can send your question in uh, uh, in, the, in the form below and maybe you could, uh, I could try tackling that in more in more detail later on, but uh, that's the best I can do right now. Um, all right, not too serious asks, what's the smallest distance that we can actually notice the Hubble constant in action? Uh, all you have to do is go beyond the local group. Um, so, uh, you know, it's very difficult to measure on uh, uh, the smaller it is. Um, but, you know, um, our closest, the next closest galaxy to the Milky Way is Andromeda. And then next to that is Triangulum. And there's some dwarf galaxies in there. So within that, our little local group of galaxies, we're generally moving together. Uh, but as soon as you look beyond that, 
then you, you a few million light years out beyond that, then you can start to notice uh, a little bit of the expansion. It's subtle, uh, but but it is there. So um, you can you know you, all the galaxies we showed so far, you know uh, would, would would actually be enough to to measure that. Uh, George Lutch asks, "Is the laser pointer in the Sky X part of the application, or did you add it?" Uh, no, it's it's part of the, it's part of the application. Uh, it's built in. Uh, you have to create an observing list uh, for the option to come up, though. All right. So, uh, not too serious asks another question. Uh, Since dark matter has mass, I would assume that it could influence gravitational lensing. How do we know that we don't get a variance in what we think a spectral image is, ac is actually saying? So, uh, yes, uh, dark matter uh, definitely affects gravitational lensing. Um, so, uh, so basically, if we look at a spectrum, um, the lines are always uh, of elements are spaced a known distance apart. Like uh, the lines of hydrogen uh, in a spectrum of a star are spaced at known distances. And even if it's shifted, the relative distance stays the same. Uh, and it can be distorted a bit, but we can, but, but the, the spectrum, the signatures of certain elements are unique enough that we can tease out uh, what distortions have had, because we have references in a lab, we have references in other galaxies, um, so we can generally figure out uh, what distortions have happened uh, due to due to all sorts of effects, um, because uh, because spectra are, are tend to be so unique and uh, and uh, detailed in the way they they are they are set up. Um, so there's definitely some things that give us pause, but we've been able to figure it all all out. Okay, uh, Phil Hester, uh, was the dust and gas that galaxies suck up from the open space there since the Big Bang, or is it being recycled from something that occurred later on? It's a good question. Uh, a little bit of A, a little bit of B. Um, so in the early universe, all there really was after, the, after things cooled down a bit uh, were hydrogen and helium. And the hydrogen and helium t came together, it formed stars, fusion in those stars created heavier elements, the stars died, spew their contents out. And so... Uh, most galaxies contain still lots of hydrogen and helium, uh, but also uh, other elements from basically recycled material. Um, and uh, sometimes there's still uh, what's called interstellar medium, basically, uh, or I'm sorry, intergalactic medium, or where there's just hydrogen and such stuff floating between galaxies, which can which can come in and essentially replenish uh, hydrogen supplies within a galaxy. Um, but oh, and sometimes it's recycled. So yeah, uh, there like uh, there is still gas coming into galaxies, um, but uh, there's also quite a bit that's recycled too. Uh, all right, so all right, so not too serious asks again another question. Can you briefly talk about what makes one type supernova different from another? Uh, so uh, there's type one and there's type two basically, uh, and uh, type ones, uh, type one A's are white dwarfs accreting material uh, until a point where it, it, it reaches a limit, uh, collapses on itself, and detonates. Uh, others are caused by very massive stars, um, supergiant stars running out of fuel and then exploding. Um, so uh, uh, sometimes, basically, the uh, uh, the chemical composition of of the star uh, and the mass of the star uh, will create a different kind of supernovae. Uh, and so they can come in all kinds of brightnesses and luminosities uh, and all kinds of different spectrum are associated with them. Uh, but the astronomers really like the type 1As because they're so predictable. They only really occur in, in this very uh, known way. And so if we see one, we, we, we astronomers get excited because uh, we can infer a lot of other properties because it's, kind of it's kind of one that's very, more well understood than others. All right, uh, I got a lot of questions here. I'm going to choose uh, uh, choose a, a few more. Um, uh, Ramesh uh, Babu Nagarajan asks, how do you conclusively say a supernova is inside a galaxy and not another star? Uh, well, one of the big clues is that um, it is its redshift. Uh, so if we if we take the redshift of the galaxy and then take the redshift of the supernova, are they the same? If they're the same, then then we know that uh, that supernova was probably in that galaxy uh, because if it was within our own galaxy uh, then uh, it would have a very different redshift it would also be a lot brighter if it were if it were much closer to us um, and also the fact that uh, spatially where it is you know usually they're going to occur close to where we see the galaxy 
Uh, and um, uh, we, there are there are automated surveys that take images of the sky essentially uh, as often as possible. And so uh, we look back at historical images, and then if something changes, like a supernova happens, we'll see this bright point where there wasn't one before. Uh, and so that's that's really how most of them are found, is just looking like, oh, one of these things is new. One of these wasn't here last time we checked. That must let's see if it's a supernova, and you, you would confirm that with a spectrum. Uh, to make sure that's really what's going on. Um, all right. Uh, uh, Sundhar uh, Ramas Ramasamy asks, can an amateur astronomer look at a st star spectra using instrumentation to see the redshift demonstrated? Yes, um, I've, I've actually done that uh, with, a, with a, a relatively cheap little device um, called a star analyzer. Uh, it's it's like a little filter you put in a telescope, and it's a diffraction grating which splits the star lights up. It's like it's not that expensive, uh, and you can take a spectrum of of, uh, of a supernova uh, or or even a quasar and uh, and see the redshift yourself. Um, so that's actually a really good I would say like a like a uh, a student project, a science fair project, is measure the redshift of something. Um, it's a little tricky, but you can you can definitely do it. Um, I, even before I worked here, actually, I, I was able to to uh, measure, the, estimate the distance to a galaxy with a type 1a supernova spectrum. I know that sounds really complicated, uh, but amateur astronomers can and do do that uh, on a regular basis, as long as it's a reasonably bright one. All right, uh, that's going to wrap up uh, the program for tonight. That's about all the time we I have for questions. Um, thank you all again. Uh, for, for joining me. Uh, if, if we didn't get to your question, you can always submit the question in the form below in the description. I see lots of lots of great ones here. I just, I'm sorry I don't have time to get to them all. Um, but uh, thank you all for joining me. Again, next week uh, we're probably going to have some moon tours, so uh, uh, stay tuned for that and have some awesome looks at the moon. Um, again, clear skies, y'all, and take care. <laughs>